Listen up, all my Chelovex and Devochkas. Today's a bullshit episode of the Cinema Shame podcast features Stephanie Crawford. I hear that Titsa puts on a real horror show. Stephanie is a radiant Twitter personality and co host of the Screamcast podcast. Let's make this episode a success so she'll have to come back and talk about 2001 with us. The Cinema Shame website is located at cinemashame.wordpress.com. Be sure to go there and check out our March prompt. That's a pirate reference. We're watching swashbucklers and pirate movies. If you're watching a swashbuckler for the first time, be sure to tag us at Cinema Shame and let us know what you think. All right, let's get on with the 10th episode of the Cinema Shame podcast and see what Stephanie has to say about A Clockwork Orange. I want to marry a lighthouse keeper and keep him company. I want to marry a lighthouse keeper and live by the side of the sea. I'll polish his lamp by the light of day so the ships at night can find their way. I want to marry a lighthouse keeper, won't that be okay? We'll take walks along the moonlit bay, maybe find a treasure too. I'd love living in a lighthouse. Dream of living in a lighthouse, baby, every single day. A dream of living in a lighthouse, so I won by the bay. So if you want Today's Cinema Shame podcast comes to you live from the Corova Milk Bar. I'm here with Stephanie Crawford, and we were sampling some of the seasonal small batch molka. What, what are you thinking about that so far? Uh, it's pretty heady. Might be the opera singer adding a little spice to it. Yeah, did you have the, the Moloko Plus, or wh- where did you start? I think that's a personal question. You need to focus on your own drink. I'm sorry. <laughs> Stephanie's here to talk about A Clockwork Orange, because she told me that she's a little light on the Kubrick and gave me the option of 2001 and A Clockwork Orange. And when I said 2001 would be great, she said, hey, let's do Clockwork Orange. Mm-hmm. I'm very charming in that way. I was like, of course, that's what I want to do all along. Now, why the general lackadaisical approach to your Kubrick? That is a great question. It's one I've wondered about over the years. Uh, I am familiar with The Shining, and I am familiar with Dr. Strangelove, and I consider those both masterpieces. And they're very impressive in how completely different they are from each other. And um, when you look at his body of work, you know, obviously you're going to find some themes, but he seemed to do it all. Um, I think there's a few things. I think part of it's intimidation. He's held so highly. Um, some When some things are maybe hyped or lauded to a certain degree it can scare me off a little bit well it dampens your enthusiasm you know you're not you don't feel like you're discovering anything that yeah that's a great way to put it exactly it it almost feels like you're always playing catch up and what's the point yeah there's no fun in just jumping on the back of a thousand other people saying yes it's amazing and then drifting into the background Mm -hmm. as you know fans of cinema and we love discovering that little strange nugget off in the corner that nobody else is paying attention to. But when it comes to watching like uh, the AFI top 100 list, there there's there's little incentive for us to dive in and just, you know, become another voice of thousands. Right, and he's one of those who has like scholarly works written about him on top of very fervent fans and when I was younger I would date film students um, and I don't know if there's anyone more passionate in the world than young men who are in film school about Stanley Kubrick and I, I, I think that did influence me away from the films a little bit you, you had a bad a bad Kubrick Kubrick impression from from one of your bows I don't like to hold that kind of thing against artists but I'm human but let's let's go back to you. So you're a film school film school groupie. Groupie. 
No, absolutely not. I actually learned that lesson pretty quickly about dating film students. You don't, you don't want to go on about that anymore because I feel like this is an interesting topic. Oh, well, no, it's, um, I don't know. I guess you're in your early 20s, your late teens. You're insufferable. Absolutely. You have a very arrogant kind of passion about things. Um, there's a lot of learning about something and immediately considering yourself an expert in that. And if there are people close to you, a lot of times you want to bury them in that. And sometimes you might make them feel like they're dumb because they didn't uh, recently learn about that with you. Um, but look yeah. where you are now. But, but look how far you've come. I mean, you can, where am I? You, you are a, a screencast icon. Oh, God. Now you're just making fun of me. I am not. I am a regular listener. I enjoy the Screamcast. Oh, well, thank you. And I enjoy your contributions to it. And I'm sure that there's someone out there who's like, you know what? I really screwed it up with Stephanie in college. <laughs> I was an insufferable twat. And I just, I told her too much about how Kubrick was the best thing ever. And now she's on a podcast trying to make up for that. Yeah. I like that. I can blame it all on him. Right. So here, here's my here's my college story because I was I was a uh, film school student in college, um, and uh, I actually met my wife in college. Oh, yeah. I'm glad your story worked out. So my story worked out. She told me she didn't like black and white movies. Wow. And I kind of had a mini heart attack, and I was like, okay. You know, maybe she just hasn't been exposed to it. I got to give her a chance because I kind of like her. She's pretty cute. So I gave her the Harvey test. I said, if you don't like Harvey, there's something wrong with you. And I showed her Harvey. She loved it. And then it was okay. So we got married like six years later. But she liked it. So that's, that's my insufferable twat film school story is that I made my wife, my future wife, watch Harvey. Oh, you turned the insufferability into something I romantic. Made it though, I, made it, I made it charming. Of course. Of course. You did. Absolutely. But let, we'll go back to Kubrick now because okay. Harvey is, is, is definitely off the reservation. Kubrick is such an elusive filmmaker, too. You know, if, if we want to if we want to talk about the auteur theory a little bit, it, it's hard to put him into that box. Um, what expectations did you have for A Clockwork Orange? You said you'd seen Dr. Strangelove. And I'm blanking on what else you'd seen. The Shining. So what, what did you bring from that? And what did you know about A Clockwork Orange going into this experience? Well, um, I think it is a pretty good choice for the shame part. Because I knew quite a bit about A Clockwork Orange without having seen it. It's almost like one of those films where I hit a point and I felt like, you know what, I kind of have seen it, even though I haven't seen it. It's so completely saturated in pop culture. It, there's so many parodies and homages. There, there's so many uh, images and pictures and moments from this movie that really have just kind of proliferated throughout. I never really felt removed from it. I never... Um, it wasn't a mysterious film to me, even though Kubrick has always had this mystique, which is fascinating. And you can't really say that about very many directors. I think, um, I almost felt like I watched the movie and when I finally did watch the movie, <laughs> um, all the scenes that I haven't seen portrayed in other places in pop culture actually shocked me. I almost thought to myself, well, this is a beautiful scene. Why hasn't anyone taken this off, <laughs> you know, as much as the milk bar or the eyelashes? This is a movie, you know, and we talk about this a lot on Cinema Shame, that the cultural omnipresence can sort of spoil 
the effect. Now, I don't believe in spoilers because I believe a movie should be able to stand on its own, whether you know what happens or have a familiarity with the iconography. And in, in this instance, I don't think that knowing uh, or being aware of the, the, the cultural omnipresence tarnishes or would uh, diminish that first experience. Was that, Am I wrong there? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. It helped convince me that I was uh, A-OK and not seeing it. It, it was almost like a comfort blanket. Um, but no, uh, actually sitting there, taking in the entire film, taking in the time period, taking its political message, you know, everything that's underneath the amazing visuals and all the iconic scenes. Um, you know, I'll never be able to look at any of them the same way again. So I definitely agree with you on that one. And I was telling you before we started recording that the first time I saw this movie, I was probably 18 and I just rewatched it for the first time this morning. And I felt like I watched a completely different film. Um, it, it totally played differently when I saw it when I was 18, I was fixated upon the more scandalous imagery. You focus on the rampant and comical sexuality played throughout um, and and the scenes of gratuitous violence um, played out comically, like the singing in the rain scene, which by now everyone must know whether they've seen the movie or not. It's got all this other stuff going on to distract the eye but when you really get down to looking at the film, it is a scathing indictment of the political institution. And I think that ev it plays out in film even more so than the novel, which I'd read in the interim. Um, the, the novel, just because of its medium, doesn't hit me as much as the film does. Have you, by chance, have you read the novel? No, unfortunately, I haven't. I did hear uh, that was more graphic than the film, though. It is definitely more graphic in the in the way that it goes about it. You know, you can get away with more in a novel, obviously, than you can visually. And Kubrick was very careful not to push it too far because he had to maintain the appeal of his degenerate main character. And if you had put some of the scenes from the novel verbatim in the film, and I know that Kubrick stayed very close to the book. He, I mean, they, the cast and crew said that he kept copies on hand for everyone to reference while they were filming. If you kept all that in, it would be a thoroughly repulsive film. Because just as an example, the first scene when he when they beat up the homeless man, they talk about how they pummeled him until he puked and um, more than blood came from his nose. And, and like, it was, it's horrible. So to put that on screen would have put off even more people than he already had. Uh, the novel is, is interesting first and foremost because of the way it invents the language. The language is taken directly from the novel. And that, that's the biggest takeaway was reading that changed the way I looked at the movie because I focused in on the, the NADSAT, as they call it. The, the made-up language of Russian and gypsy and cockney slang. The last chapter issue is, is an interesting topic to discuss as well. I don't know if you got into that. They, they removed the last chapter of the book for the American release in Kubrick. I did hear about that. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, thing to read about the way that the author reacts to that and the introduction to the um, latter editions of the book have that last chapter added back in and with his introduction about how the publisher didn't didn't want it in and Kubrick had no didn't have any interest in it but um, we can talk about that a little later too that 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 is an important detail about how they deal with the moral compass of the film before we we dive in do you have any more 
thoughts before we bring out all of your A Clockwork Orange demons that have now arisen from watching the film? Mm, I'm ready to get to the demons. Alex. No, I wouldn't say he's positive. I would just say that there's this strange uh, psychological identification with him. It's probably what attracted me to the book, is this strange uh, duality of uh, a character who is plainly evil, and yet um, because of him operating on this uh, unconscious level, uh, makes you aware of things in your own personality which you then identify with him. Villains are always more interesting characters. It's very hard to make good people interesting. It's, it's, it's undoubtedly easier and more fun to hold folly and vice up to ridicule than it is to present goodness and say, isn't that wonderful? Why don't you all be that way? Better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. A Clockwork Orange was released in New York City on December 19th, 1971 in the UK the following January. 1972 it um cost 2.2 million to make and made back and made 26 million at the box office the u.s ratings board gave it an x for the explicit sexuality and violence kubrick re-released it in 1973 to get the r rating and remove some of the sexuality the uk oddly enough uh, it passed without issue, it passed the board without issue. Um, but uh, Kubrick received death threats and was very taken aback by the copycat crimes that started to take place where people would start to blame their actions on the Clockwork Orange film. The, the film was never actually released in the UK on home video until 1999 after his death. The reaction to the film were, were mostly positive, but uh, at the same time, there were a few violent detractors. Uh, Roger Ebert gave it two stars and said that all it does is celebrate the nastiness of its hero. Um, Pauline Kael in particular wrote, in the New Yorker magazine, it's, she says, literal-minded in its sex and brutality, Teutonic in its humor, Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange might be the work of a strict and exacting German professor who set out to make a porno, violent sci-fi comedy. Is there anything sadder and ultimately more repellent than a clean-minded pornographer? Now, I, I do love reading Pauline Kael's reviews, but <laughs> they're, they're, even when you don't agree with her right Lord. there there are all there's a few of hers and i love the way that she spins things um her her treatment uh, of clockwork orange i mean it goes on i mean she she has no shortage of terrible things to say about a clockwork orange and and it's it strikes me that she reacted that way when most everyone was pretty positive about how the film was satirical at its heart. And she seems to be focusing on the specific imagery of the film in her review. What were your thoughts? Now, our perspective in 2018 is far different than 1972. What are your thoughts on the the graphic nature of this film looking back? And how do you, um, I guess I should say, do you still think it has the ability to shock people today? I put a lot of blame on young film students and reputation when it came to not seeing this film for a long time. But another big part of that actually tied into its reputation of violence, especially sexual violence. Uh, that was a big thing that actually kept me from seeing it for a really long time. I, you know, I, I watch a lot of violent movies and a lot of them uh, do have sexual assault in them. When you have a film with 
a reputation like a clockwork orange, you get quite a bit more warnings about that kind of content than you would, let's say, just any low budget horror movie. And I think that was really influential in keeping me away from seeing this. So I I was actually really happy this film came up to actually see it. Uh, I was able to steal myself for it. And it is graphic. It is brutal. But it part of its message is the way it's filmed. It's very staged and it's very artful and it's interesting because it there's this dichotomy of everything is kind of placed in a way where it pulls you in it forces you to pay attention to everything going on the screen but also kind of removes you emotionally from it a little bit and that was a very interesting experience for me I didn't really find myself actively disturbed by it. And I, I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm on a horror movie podcast, but it's really not hard to emotionally upset me or disturb me. I'm fairly sensitive when it comes to films, and I didn't quite have the reaction to this film I expected. It certainly earned its reputation for the brutality, but I I don't think it's ever hit me uh, the way it has with any other film I've ever seen in my entire life. In a way, I'm still processing it because of that kind of push and pull of the way everything is filmed. Yeah, Kubrick is very tactful when it comes to the sexual assault. Um, None of it is explicit. We are, as viewers, we are left to fill in the blanks. And sometimes that is uh, more impactful. But he does uh, quite a few things to distance us from the events on screen. Obviously, we can talk about the, the singing in the rain scene. The which is the first major scene that comes up that at face value should I mean it should repulse us what's what's going on on screen and when they filmed that they they had, Kubrick had filmed had, had done run through it and he said it was frigid and lacked any emotion and was probably insinuating that it was cruel um and he asked malcolm mcdowell if he knew how to dance so you know malcolm mcdowell said sure i i can i can do a little dance and he's like okay well do you know any songs and malcolm mcdowell said well i know singing in the rain so he said good go with that so that was an improvisation on set that and became a plot point an amazing That's fixture in the film right because that wasn't planned and yet it it uses that as a major plot point later in the film when the writer finally recognizes who he is. And then it plays, I mean, the original plays during the end credits. Right, Pete, check the rest of the house. Dead. And can I say something that also 
uh, worked against me seeing this film is my favorite film of all time. Any genre is singing in the rain. I could see why that would be. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you've got this Malcolm McDowell explained it is like the singing in the rain song was perfect because it was just about somebody having the time of his life. And in this moment, our despicable anti-hero is having the time of his life, right? So he sings Singing in the Rain. And that has an extraordinary power to distance the viewer from what's going on because it feels so staged and it feels so theatrical. And it's recalling this massive landmark film. So there's, there's this aura of artificiality. So we can look at the scene intellectually rather than emotionally. And Kubrick does that throughout this film. Remo well, removes us from the emotion. Even preceding that, uh, there's another rival gang about to engage in a gang rape that's literally on a stage. Correct. Yeah. And, it, man, it really holds on this poor, brutalized uh, woman. But if you, you know, I was paying attention... They had their hands on her in like very deliberate ways, um, like on her stomach and on her arms, kind of pushing and pulling her. Um, and even though it's very disturbing, it wasn't as graphic as it's you would assume theatrical. it would be. It's very as theatrical. Very, yes. <laughs> and, and the stage teases you in that direction. So, I mean, it, it starts out, you, you, you begin that scene with the ornate sculpture around the arch of the stage. And then it pulls back slowly to reveal this decrepit auditorium. The seats are thrown about. Some, I mean, most of them are gone. Like, it's just absolutely destroyed. This is the theater of dystopia. And on that stage, you're having this tug of war over this naked woman. And and the the rival gang billy boy and his and his droogs are all dressed in military camo and they're wearing uh german crosses and it's all very like dystopian west side story kind of thing thou globby bottle of cheap stinking chip oil come and get one in the yarbles if you have any yarbles you eunuch jelly thou so you're you're given this setting boys. that it, it immediately sets you up to read this as theatrics and it gives you a reason to side with alex early on oh he breaks up this brutal rape scene like he's better than that he just wants to get at his rival I was wondering if that was supposed to be a misdirection when it started playing out. Yeah, I wondered that myself. It was, it was clear they weren't there to save the girl, but in the situation, they comparatively were the heroes. Yeah, and that's the thing. Kubrick is very tactful like that throughout this film. He, he's giving you reasons to side with this horrible human. Um, there was interesting thing I, I, I read um, that this film engages in a lot of old-fashioned sexism, particularly as it treats the female perspective, because there is none. It's totally removed from the film. No, you get a POV from a uh, breast. <laughs> that's the closest you get. That's true. In, in the absence of the female perspective, it is a complete indictment of the male sexual pack behavior and aggression. Kubrick was really big on focusing on the, um, the toxicity of the male relationships. But there's also a couple times when he spins that in the other direction, when there's an interesting twist or tenderness on the male behavior. And in this movie, it's particularly perverted because of the nature of the dynamics. But maybe we'll get back to that later. It may not be relevant. <laughs> um, but 
you know, there, there's a lot of voice in here. And we're talking about the female perspective that I can see clearly transferring through something like um, American Psycho and the director, Mary Heron, the, the voice of the narrator, the vivid voice of the narrator, um, the way music plays to diminish the brutality in the film. And I did like that aspect. And you, you you can probably tell me. I'm not sure how much it plays in the book. But I did like, you know, these boys weren't shooting up drugs. They were taking them from milk. He was able to engage in a lot of brutality and I think in a way elevate himself above a lot of things because of the music he listened to. These very like childlike soothing things he had the entire time as crutches and i really liked those details quite a bit um kubrick had an interesting quote that kind of speaks speaks to that it it was in the um, press tours i believe after the release of the film he said alex makes no attempt to deceive himself or the audience as to his total corruption and wickedness he is the very personification of evil on the other hand he has winning qualities his total candor his wit his intelligence and his energy there are attractive qualities and ones i might add which he shares with richard the third so he set up this completely likable character that does terrible things in this environment and he spoke about the drugs and the, the drugs are, are more of a, a part of the book, but there's no more purpose to them than here. They're just more prevalent. I don't even, they're not even really clear about what's in the milk. <laughs> 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 Something's in the milk and it makes them, makes them do weird things. So that's the way they sell their drugs to kids th- through the milk bars. Um, and the, of course, the imagery in the milk bar is nothing but, you know, naked mannequins with nipples that leak milk. You know, it, the the imagery in this film is is repulsively comical. The the constant artwork on the walls is all very grotesque sexuality, um, pop sexuality, the, the mannequins in the milk bar. There's always boobs somewhere in the movie. Um, and then you get to the point where he, he murders a woman with a plastic phallus and testicles. Yeah, giant one. Giant, giant phallus. I mean... It... And with a lot of uh, violent yonic imagery cut in <laughs> during the entire scene. It's, it's not subtle. No, no, it's not. And it, the... The heightened sexuality totally plays into Kubrick's uh, methods for diminishing the the impact of the sexual aggression. Do you think that ties into making it more palatable to ratings or the audience? I think it, it, it serves to make the film more palatable to audiences. Um, interesting backstory that, that does come into play with the, with the filming of A Clockwork Orange is that um, even as early as 1967, Napole- um, Napoleon um, Kubrick was trying to make his Napoleon film. He had started writing a treatment while he was working on 2001 and he was desperately trying to get backing for the napoleon picture 2001 had been a huge hit he had two of the highest of the 50 highest grossing films of all time i think at this point but he couldn't get backing for napoleon because the studios were so gun shy about historical epics so he originally didn't have any connection to a clock corner she'd been given the book and kind of dismissed it so after 2001 he had again tried to get Napoleon made, and they, the studio still didn't want to do it. He had a deal, and it fell through because of the turnover at MGM. 
so he he ultimately decided to make a clockwork orange because he could do it on a smaller budget it would be sort of like an indie movie for him and he believed it could be a huge money maker in light of the recent trends in cinema which had been the the youth culture i think easy rider had been a huge landmark in, at the box office for for this youth culture movement um, Bonnie and Clyde. These movies were making a ton of money and, and signified a trend that he wanted to catch on to. And he believed that if he made a film with a lower budget, independent style that made a lot of money, he could convince the studios he can make Napoleon on a smaller budget and make them a lot of money. Obviously, it didn't happen. But most people suggest that that was the reason he made A Clockwork Orange at all, as a picture in between 2001 and what he believed to be Napoleon. So you've got that going for you. What a bridge. It's so funny what becomes a landmark. Well, you know, I think, all right, so Easy Rider is the reason that we have A Clockwork Orange. Yeah. Absolutely. I, it's funny that uh, Finian's Rainbow didn't start off the trend and went with the Midnight Cowboy and Easy Rider's route. <laughs> That's a joke. I, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> a, it's, a, it's, a strange, it's a strange web. You know, Finian's Rainbow is timeless. And by timeless, I mean it's disappeared from public consciousness forever. Tom is less at one Finian's Rainbow. Sorry, Coppola. <laughs> Though it, it did just did it just get a Blu-ray release? I don't know. I think Warner Does Archive had something. Know? I don't know. Does it matter? Did anyone watch it? If a Finian's Rainbow is released to the wild, does it? Does anyone watch it? All right, I think we have our answer. <laughs> <laughs> I actually haven't seen it. Have you? I... Yes, yes, I have. Well, they, maybe okay. Tell tell me a little bit about that. How how does that? How does that work? I, I mean, I know about it, but I've never seen little. it. <laughs> Fred Astaire was uh, pretty elderly in it. That's yeah. pretty much the only thing I recall. Mm. My That's my Finian's Rainbow story is that a copy. So th that DVD was out of print for a long time, and it was fetching stupid prices. And there was a copy of it at my half price books. And every time there's a 50% off sale, I'm like, is now the time I bite and watch this movie? <laughs> <laughs> and as you can tell, the answer was always no. Uh, the copy's still there if anyone's interested. At least last uh, I checked. I wish you got it. That would make an interesting companion piece to A Clockwork Orange. <laughs> Maybe next time you're the host, I'm the guest, and we talk about Finian's Rainbow. Yeah, there's a reason I don't have my own podcast. It's because I bring up things like Finian's Rainbow when people are trying to talk about A Clockwork Orange. Well, that's why we have you on our podcasts. <laughs> Take the reins back, you James. do. I mean, I think we could go back and forth on this a little while. You'll love it here. You'll have everything you left behind in Glockamora. You hear that? What did I tell you? The same Skylark music we have back in Ireland. Aye, Glockamara Skylark. Aye. I hear a bird, a Glockamara bird. It well may be he's bringing me a cheering word. I hear a breeze, a river shallon breeze. It well may be it's followed me. One one of the getting getting back to a clockwork orange now that we had that magnificent that magnificent segue. All right. I'll probably put in a nice clip from the movie there. Great. Um the the nature of the film as a conversation about morality. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now that's a um infinitely wide chasm for you to fill 
So what what did you take away from Stanley Kubrick's morality tale? Oh, thank you for not asking me what is morality. Okay. No, I, I don't want to do that because I, you know that that would just cause guests to melt in the puddle of goo, and I don't I don't need that. I don't need to clean that up. Ooh, appreciate it. I'll stick to Kubrick's specific morality here. That was the overriding theme that I admired most in this film which was the constant acknowledgement that morality is gray. And that doesn't mean like, oh, maybe they're not such a bad guy. <laughs> it's acknowledging that evil is complex. Alex is a terrible piece of shit. I never felt bad for anything he went through. But at the same time, there were absolutely hints in there that he suffered abuses and that might be debatable but from what I gleaned from it I feel like he did suffer abuse when he was younger uh, from people close to him and even though everything on the surface while odd look, looked like he had a fine family life um you know, evil doesn't come from a vacuum. And when, <laughs> even when he's arrested and there's always a part of me that wants to see terrible people really suffer, the fact that he's beaten and spit on um, shows that even the quote-unquote good guys are disgusting as well. Every, the entire uh, experiments, the prison, everyone, uh, it's complex it's gray. It's disgusting and messy. Uh, and it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes of um, from the rules of the game, which is the tragedy is everyone has their reasons. And a clockwork orange, I think, exemplifies that perfectly. Uh, I There are some moments that I think it could read that we're supposed to sympathize or empathize with Alex, but I think it's just... Being very honest in a very stylized way that, unfortunately, we don't get easy answers. And if you try to fool yourself that there are easy answers, things are just going to get even uglier underneath. And the problem's going to get deeper. And I think that informed every story beat. And that's what I really, truly admired the most out of this film. It, it is a very interesting interplay between the different um, f factions. I mean, you've got the state um, versus the individual. Then you've got the, the prison, the police, the home. All of these were deliberately laid out and to have different opposing forces when it came to this perspective of morality and who is doing right. The, the brilliant premise that we're left with here is that we have this Mephistophelian, Mephistophelian, Mephist that man, that just, just does not roll off the tongue. Mephistophelian <laughs> character who is at face value a terrible person he should be condemned in any reasonable movie but we're left with questions about whether he's the sane one whether he's the righteous one in many ways because he is living life to the fullest and enjoying life and and embracing many of the aspects that we cite as good it just happens to be he's doing it with harm to other people. But in turn, everyone in this film is doing right, but harming other people. With the exception of one character, and this is something I didn't, I, I brushed right by when I was 18. But who's the only actually decent character in this movie? I can't stand the suspense anymore. 
the priest. Hmm. Who he's the only one that says maybe this shouldn't be done. And he's talked over the whole time. He's minimized. And I'm not saying that he's, you know, someone that should be held up as like a pinnacle of society. But in this movie, he's the one that says that, listen, reconditioning removes the ability to choose right from wrong. You are forced to do right. And that is not morality. He's a minor character, but he's he's actually our conscience. He's what we're supposed to be seeing in this movie. It is interesting with art when they tackle um, issues when it comes to freedom of choice. And do we have a natural morality or is it just a part of society? I, you know, there's definitely kind of an undercurrent of, um, is Alex like the honest lizard brain of us or because they certainly don't make, you know, they basically torture his eyeballs, drug him up, uh, cause him terrible pain. Uh, there (laughs) where it's, Yeah. Sorry, it's, 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 there's so much going on there because there's never a point where uh, you look at him, you're like, oh, he's a good guy now. Well, he had a rough patch. I, I think that treatment really helped him out. Oh, it totally there's worked. It was absolutely it was no you know, question. Everything about we that know was ideal. He was, he was tortured and his brain is now broken. And that, that falls into the grayness, I think, again, because... I, I don't think there really is a right here because it was, it was clearly never the intent um, for these people to bring goodness in the world. They were trying to get results, basically. Right. The the specific line that I wrote that, this down as I watched it, the, the priest says, but he's... Um... He ceases to be a wrongdoer, but he ceases to be a creature of moral choice. And the, uh, I don't know if this was the um, minister that said this um, in response exactly. He said, these are subtleties we are not concerned with. Moral ethics, we are only concerned with cutting down crime. He will be a true Christian. He's ready to be crucified rather than crucify. That's that's a clockwork orange in two 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 exchanges. Yep. <laughs> Pretty much. We'll just cut it down to that one scene. We'll remove all of the rampant sexuality and violence, and that's a clockwork orange. But you've also got all the issues with the state, how he then becomes used as a pawn. The notion that the far left and the far right look exactly the same is an interesting concept, too. That's a that's a totally different podcast and something I'm not even prepared to tackle. Too bad, buddy, because that's why I'm here. Oh, all right. Well, I'll just let you go. take over here and I'm going <laughs> to get a get another drink from the the Corova bar. And you can just opine about the political fascism. And um, yeah, I'll I'll see you back in, what, 20, 25 minutes? All right. Okay, I'm going to start. We're going to talk about Bolshevik. No. I did, um, yeah, when they they pointed out, like, oh, no, he would be perfect. He's young. He's outgoing. I thought that was wonderful because they clearly just wanted someone they could splash across the papers. Alex has a kind of power that isn't um, – he has power in his own ugly little world. And then even when he was a pawn, he had a power because he's young, he's charming, he's – 
self-assured when, you know, he's not being tortured. And we, we see that today. Uh, we use the young or the beautiful or the charming, and they're used as mouthpieces and tools. Yep. This is a potent movie. It's very potent. Because like you said, it's, it's hard to remove the expectation, the what you know about this film, and sit down and watch it as Kubrick wanted you to. Uh, I would just say that it's, you know, it's an entertainment of, of a kind. It's a satirical black comedy, of course. Um, very much a comedy, though, I would have thought. You see, I'm always very surprised um, when, at the time uh, that the film came out, that everybody um, said it was a very violent film and condemned it out of hand uh, for glorifying violence. I don't think it does that, actually. Um, I think it actually uh, does exactly the opposite. The, the one thing that will be difficult for you to discuss, so I'm definitely going to go into it right now. Fantastic. Right. So you haven't seen 2001. I have seen parts of it, parts but of no, it. I haven't sat down to taken it in as a film. It It is a difficult film to watch. In an entirely different way than A Clockwork Orange could be seen as a difficult film to watch. But 2001 and A Clockwork Orange are in many ways uh, companion films. I'm sure you're aware of the star baby. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. At the That's end... what they call me at the clubs. <laughs> at the end of a 2001, the star baby turns and faces the camera. Okay, spoilers. Spoiler alert. I, I, I know you don't believe in them. I don't believe them. I okay. don't believe anyone is going to send me any hate mail about talking about the end of 2001. Well, Homer played the star baby in the Simpsons. True. So, I'm fine. so <laughs> I'll just send them. I'll just remind them about the Simpsons episode and we'll call it a day. So Simpsons. at the end, <laughs> star baby turns to look at the camera. And that is where we where we begin A Clockwork Orange with Alex staring directly into the camera. Interesting. And this is further detailed by taking text from Arthur C. Clarke's 2001, which explains the ending in ways I can never begin to if you actually read the novel. Can you read the novel to us? I will read a selection from the novel that I think clarifies my point. How's that? All right. Though he was master of the world, he was not quite sure what to do next, but he would think of something. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> That's wonderful. It gets better in a second, right? So the beginning of Burgess's novel... The Clockwork Orange. What's it going to be then, eh? The movie begins with the with Alex and his droog sitting at the milk bar deciding what to do next. You are blowing my mind right now. The little little pop I heard, blood vessels. <laughs> I got it. I gotta go. <laughs> I'll just give you a moment to recover from that moment. <laughs> so it's all about choice. 2001, I, which I can't even begin to get into right now because that's like seven podcasts and 12 hours of nonsense. But the bottom line is you're left with this choice for the future. What now can we do? The ephemeral spirit base of 2001 is then transported back to the horrible stinking filthy earth for a clockwork orange the perversion of choice in every imaginable way see and when i when i watched the film again today and saw the the first shot is just alex saying straight at you and that's that's when all that fell into place. So I'd seen 2001 much more recently than A Clockwork Orange. 
so then you like, oh my gosh, I have this amazing idea. And you go to your books about A Clockwork Orange and look up the Stanley Kubrickness of it all. And like, well, everyone's written about this. This is not news. <laughs> but it is interesting. Um, can you do me a favor? Yes. Can you write a BuzzFeed article, Top 20 Reasons Why Alex is Star Baby? And use a lot of gifts so I can understand it. Oh, I can do that. I would really appreciate that. Well, the gift the gifts are how we convey that information to the masses. The perversion of choice. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so in a, just a matter of moments after it gets shared about 47,000 times, we will have made our point to the world and the world, the world's problems will be solved. Well, I'm glad we learned from a clockwork orange that there are easy answers and people can do right immediately. If only we'd paid attention 46 years ago. Okay, I'm biting my tongue right now. I don't want to get political. Yes, exactly. I, we have gotten, we, we've teased politics in the past, but we've, we, haven't, we haven't actually gotten there yet. So maybe that, that's all right. What's happening? I'm, I'm looking through my notes for my next <laughs> interesting factoid. Oh, Oh, did you do that thing where you zoned out and you just started drawing, like, black holes on every single page? I had my, like, Shazam yeah. star baby moment. And I'm like, I'm fucking done. Because I just dropped star baby 2001 information. And usually you just kind of walk out of the room at that point. Or you're there for another six hours and you're at an Irish pub because you're so drunk you can't leave. Because that's <laughs> when you talk about 2001. Huh. Um, so I didn't have plans beyond that. Fair enough. Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. So let's just bypass <clears throat> all the other things that I that I had to say. Sure. And go right to where do you see this movie in modern cinema? Like, how do you see its tentacles reaching out in 2018? I think those tentacles are uh, f firmly, but in a friendly manner, mm -hmm. all over the place. Uh, you can certainly tell the time period this is from, but I think thanks to the incredible original art style, the language. It made itself kind of timeless. Its themes are absolutely timeless. There are issues we've been dealing with for centuries. It's, it's humanity. Uh, I think it continues to inspire, um, whether you're a young, pretentious film student or... Those young, pretentious film students love Clockwork Orange. You're right. Yeah. Is it? Is it almost like you? It's Fight Club, and then you're like, move on to a Clockwork Orange. Funny like, you know, should Fight mention Club that because childish. when I was in film school, everybody wanted to make Fight Club. It was like it came out what like the year before, and it was all. Anybody could talk about Fight Club. It's like you walked into class and like at least there were four or five separate conversations about Fight Club. No, I, I feel like there are a lot of dorm rooms that had Tyler Durden and Alex on the walls. Same time. Oh, yeah. Oh. Right next to each other. Renaissance guys, I could tell. Mm. Okay, don't go down. Don't walk down Not that far. Okay. memory lane, Stephanie. No. Don't do it. Okay. No, this uh, it it's kind of a perfect film in a way because you could uh, enjoy it on a very surface level. It's beautifully shot. 
The actors are wonderful. It's Let's strange. talk about Malcolm McDowell while we're on actors. Like, how great is the tightrope that he walks in this film? He was perfect. I, I think I read, I'm not sure if it was a rumor, that Kubrick almost wouldn't do the film if he couldn't get McDowell. Yeah. And I, I do think that's believable because even I think he was in his late 20s playing a teenager, but he has a very wide young face. But we all know how sinister he can make his eyes and his voice. Well, he'd see he, Kubrick had seen first. him in If and said, right. that's my guy. Um, the, the age is also another. We talked about the way Kubrick uh, diminished the impact of some of the sexual relations um, he picked. He picked McDowell partly because of if, partly because of the age. He wanted an older character. He wanted an older actor. In the book, the act, the character is supposed to be fifteen, and he's basically raping ten-year-olds, and some of that's irredeemable. <laughs> so in in the book, when when he picks up the 10 year olds at the record shop. Oh, also while we're on the record, the record thing, I don't even know what that was. It's like a, it's like a in, indoor strip mall anyway. So he's at that record stand. And did you notice the record that was right in front of him? The 2001, the 2001 vinyl like, soundtrack. This guy has a sense of humor. I appreciate that. <laughs> So the girls that he then picks up there in the book were 10, and he goes home and kind of oh, rapes them. Oh, God. He t- um, but in the, in the movie, it's he shifted like that completely scene. by making them um, older. They're not 10. Sensual. Right. And willing. Ben Hill, almost. Right. Totally. Like, why bother at that point? Um, but then he uses the the technique of the fast motion to make it comical again and the what's interesting about that is that it it diminishes our immediate impact right like you see that and it's played with the william tell overture and that's funny yeah (laughs) The, the the scene the way that it's engaged like you start with two girls and a guy and then one gets up and gets dressed and and he's still having sex with the other one on the bed and then she's done she gets up and gets dressed he gets the other one back in bed like it's just a cycle all set to william tell uh funny stuff but the ratings board uh the the u.s ratings board specifically cited that scene as the reason it received the X rating, because it it was worried that straight pornography would co-opt the technique to pass more through the sensor. I love that detail. It's completely unfair to the film. Completely. It, it takes it <laughs> but... completely out of context, right? And, like, they're so afraid of that lascivious pornography <laughs> reaching into society. And so were they stuff. aroused when they watched it? I and like, Oh, well, porn's going to use this. This is great. Well, I mean, you can go, you can take that right back to the argument over American psycho, right? I mean, mm-hmm. that was originally given an NC 17 rating for its sexuality. Never mind all the brutal murder in the movie. That is far worse than any of the sexuality. Nah, we don't care about that as much in America. No, no, no. The the the, the whole axe murderer part, that's cool. But the menage a trois scene is just way too much for our sensibilities, you know. So as much as things have changed, they haven't changed at all. We still have the same problems. We're not European yet. Oh, <laughs> We're waiting for it to happen. No. We're so not European. Um, I was going somewhere before I got off on that tangent, but that seemed like a good place to go. So what what was I talking about? Mm. I don't know either. Naked people? Naked people. Right. Anyway, Mystery do you have anything? Did, did you have anything else to say on that matter while I figure out what I was doing? Uh, about the 2001 record? Anything you want. Do you have 2001 on vinyl? Because I do. Um, I think I do because my dad had it. Okay. And I, I have all the records. Like I have um, some Star Wars vinyl. <laughs> Why is that funny? <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all have Star Wars on vinyl? The originals? 
Apparently, yes. Apparently. And Gordon Lightfoot. I don't, I don't. I have Kenny Loggins. I don't have Gordon Lightfoot. I have a lot of Kenny Loggins. Got to get the Lightfoot, man. Mm. I don't. I don't often get down on my knees to sift through the dollar bins. Um, so and I don't know if that's where Gordon's hiding or not. I, wow. That's where I got the. That's where I got the. No, a lot though. of people told me how snooty you were and how snooty, snooty this podcast was, and I shouldn't do it. Because I'm a very humble and down to earth person, but you, I said, you, "Oh have, no!" Did you listen from the beginning? Because we started with Police Academy, you know. Yeah. Did that wasn't enough to sell you on the whole thing? Well, that's kind of a hipster thing. Oh, Police Academy! No, Police Academy <laughs> three is a hipster thing. The okay, what's Police Mission Academy. to Moscow? Oh, that's six. I well, I know, but where does that fall in <laughs> the hipster scale? <laughs> yes. I, uh, I don't know if I don't know if hipsters have gotten to six yet. I don't, I don't know if millennials have gotten that far. Finian's Rainbow, it's a police academy. How much are you regretting having me on? By the way, I'm curious. None. Okay. Absolutely none. <laughs> If this isn't the best conversation we've had on Cinema Shame, I don't know what. <laughs> You're very kind. Thank you. <laughs> there's okay. um, there's probably something to say about the music, because the music is interesting in this film. So it starts with a very synthy score and um, migrates back and forth between Beethoven's Ninth and Rossini and, and William Tell. And as we said, the singing in the rain becomes integral to the plot. Um, Beethoven's Ninth becomes the trigger. He, he has his violent reactions, not necessarily ultimately to sex and violence but to the music he was conditioned to hate even though it was the thing he loved the classical music is also used as a way to set him apart from the other people in the film who clearly don't care for it the classical music is treated as a relic um, something unusual to this character uh, at home it's treated with complete indifference and the interviewers, when they're conditioning, and he comments on the um, the use of Beethoven's Ninth in the background of the conditioning films, they are surprised when he recognizes it. <laughs> Which I thought was an interesting point to make. Yeah, it, it was a nice little moment showing that they really didn't see him as a human being. Well, what I thought was also interesting in that particular scene was the different reactions between the male and the mm -hmm. female watching. Did you pick up on that? I don't think I did. Um, there's a moment where there is a definite pause in the woman I don't, I don't remember exactly what her role was they all had different roles within the, the conditioning and rehabilitation cycle um, the, the one guy of course was ignored it completely and it was like well basically that that's the breaks for him like he's he's going to you know this is a beloved piece of music to him and he's going to hate it now screw him and the woman paused and looked over to him and gave him a questioning look. The, the male aggression and violence 
um, is even played out when it comes to the the specific elements of the character, um, how we're supposed to take the element of choice, the morality, the the male on male aggression. And I think that was also a very intentional moment where the woman felt a, even if it wasn't an overriding sense of um, sympathy to act, it certainly caused her to pause. Whereas the other guy was like, you know, he's a deadbeat, let him suffer. The electronic music in in this score also, I think, stands out. The way it comes in and out of the score in between the classical music. Wendy Carlos was born Walter Carlos. She studied at the Columbia and Princeton Electronic Music Center and oversaw the original development of the Moog synthesizer. Ooh. An interesting factoid, don't you think? Yeah, I'm a big fan of the rentals. I appreciate them. <laughs> <laughs> so then Walter Carlos worked alongside the the development of the Moog um, and then was one of the first public figures to disclose having a gender reassignment surgery and became Wendy. And that was in 1978, I believe. Oh. So, so that's... <laughs> That's historical, right? I mean, I don't know how many people I, actually I wish I knew about publicized it. that or not. <laughs> but... Wendy Carlos or Walter Carlos. Um, I, don't, I don't know which way we're supposed to go with that. Um, she also did the score for The Shining and Tron. Hey, get ready for some more shame. I've never seen Tron. Well, that's okay. It's, it's, um, it's not a movie that I recommend going back to unless you already have that nostalgia. Oh. So, I mean, if you want to get a taste of the soundtrack, because that's pretty cool, go right ahead. No, I just wanted to see if I can make you gasp. No, there's no gasping. Like Tron. Um, it's it's one of those things that you just Citizen Kane. I understand, but Tron. How dare oh, how dare you demean Tron with Citizen Kane? <laughs> but the point I was eventually going to get to was there is a very popular recording of Peter and the Wolf done in the late 80s with Weird Al Yankovic. I'm not kidding. Wendy Carlos and Weird Al Yankovic redid Peter and the Wolf. I think it was 1988 or so. I hate myself for not knowing any of this. Hello, boys and girls. This is a story that I like to call Peter and the Wolf. Are you sitting comfortably? Are you? Oh, good. Then let's begin. It's I remember it being as being pretty great when I was 10 years old, so maybe you want to re check that out. So you didn't have that eureka moment. The whole thing was a little bit like Al Capone's vault in that respect, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry I let you down, Geraldo. Scarface Al Capone may have built it, and nobody knows what's in it. Some say money. Some say body. Some say it's booby trap, and we're going to open it. What secret lies inside? It may be Scarface Al Capone's biggest secret, and we'll open it on live television. Step inside the vault with me on April 21st. Discover the mystery only on Channel 11, Monday, April 21st at 8 p.m. You did great. That was all on me, man. Well, <laughs> I have to take partial responsibility for my affinity for Weird Al Yankovic, I guess. 
Um, I love Weird Al. I have no excuse. Well, now, no, now it's on you. See, you love Weird Al, but you don't know the Peter I'll, and Wolfson. I am here to be shamed. No, yep. I will take it. Good. You know, I don't have a lot of other stuff I wanted to talk about. Um, so if you want to share any further thoughts you had about A Clockwork Orange right now, Stanley Kubrick, um, I, I think that there's enough uh, to talk about with Stanley Kubrick to fill hundreds of podcasts. So, you know, maybe that's not the, the best way to spin that open-ended question. But, yeah, so do you have anything to talk about with Stanley Kubrick? Well, uh, <laughs> so far... <laughs> <laughs> hey, here's something. Here's something. Ah, what? <laughs> I'm going for just eureka moments here. Come on. Uh, Clockwork Orange is nominated for four Academy Awards. All right. All Director, right. picture, editing, and adapted screenplay. The big question is who did it lose to? Oh, I know this. Repeatedly, which I thought was odd. Um, nineteen seventy-two Academy Awards. It's not the Godfather, is it? No. Are you sure? I am sure. <laughs> I am positive. May I have the envelope, please? Oh, thank you. The winner is the French Connection, Philip D'Antonio, producer. The French Connection is a great film. It is. I just thought it was, it was interesting that in every category it was nominated, the French Connection won. Every single one? All four categories, the French Connection won. That's interesting because I do think that's a brilliant film, but it is it is quite a bit more traditional than our Clockwork Orange. It is, and it's a, a film, again, that I love, but I, I don't even consider it in the Best Picture category. You know, it's just, to me, it's not a film that wins Best Picture. Yeah, and if you want to go back to talking about cultural impact, you pretty much, the French Connection it impacts film nerds, I guess. But you don't really see that poster on the wall next to Tyler Durden. No. Like you do at the Clockwork Orange. And the the... James Bel- the the James Bel- the John Belushi college poster. So that's like between them. Maybe it's like the buffer. Did you have buffer posters? I know I had a Wu Tang poster. Perfect. <laughs> um, something feels like I had like a, a, a Miles Davis poster. Maybe you know I was one of those geeks. Yeah, okay. Because they I'm had the poster fiction. sales on campus and like somebody had a Coltrane poster. Like you're either a Coltrane guy or a Miles Davis guy. <laughs> like even if you didn't listen to jazz, like you wanted to be that guy. <laughs> you, you would force people into choosing a side. Right. You had to have a side. You, there's no in-betweens. There's no moral gray area no. in this war, Mm-mm. folks. <laughs> I had a big Peacemaker poster. George Clooney, Nicole Kidman Wait, for I was... right. Um, so that'll date my college existence because I got it free at a like early screening of the Peacemaker, and it was a double sided poster. So I put it on my closet backwards, so the thing opened up as like my closet. So I had it split in the middle. Any point you can stop bragging about how cool you were in college, man. At any point. Really, I was just wondering why I put it on backwards. Because I remember distinctly putting it on the wrong side. Like, because you're not one of those sheeple, man, right. you know? Right, no, those are the worst. <laughs> worst. My uh, roommate had a Sunny Day real estate poster. I'm not sure how that's relevant, but he had a really big one over his bed. The details Great. that stay in your brain... <sighs> How much of your classes do you remember? I remember getting a D in my philosophy class because the TA thought I got snarky about (laughs) Plato. 
and he gave me a zero on a paper I actually wrote, and the presser wouldn't change it. Anyway, that's a that's a whole separate scar. That, that I, is I don't another twelve part podcast series. I mean, that's therapy right there. Uh, this isn't this isn't just about me. What did you have in your walls? I did not have a dorm, but I had oh. Empire Records. And Didn't I had Final dorm. Destination. Final Destination. Well, the, I went opening weekend and they gave it for free. It's one of, And it's I had a, never a received a free situation. poster. Yeah. No, I, I still love that movie. I will defend that movie. Um, and I you, had like you, a bunch of... You don't of think the... I'm going to defend Peacemaker now? <laughs> That's why I'm here, apparently. <laughs> I'm not sure anymore. Uh, and a whole lot of Universal monster posters Mm -hmm. yeah no wu-tang i'm sorry well that that's a mistake but what about the uh miles davis and coltrane situation oh i'm not touching that what you have to pick a side there's no in between no i don't sir you do adults now oh that never stops this isn't crazy college times. I don't know what this podcast is anymore. It's it's far more poignant than my other podcast, so you've got that going for you. I'm so sorry. Next time you can be on the bondage pod and the 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 real like barrier to entry is just being able to drink enough to talk incoherently about whatever comes up. I have a bottle of tequila in my freezer right now. I'm ready. All right, let's make this a two for. Yeah. What, well, Come I, on. What's what's next? What else is on your agenda? What have, what have you been watching recently? Does it relate to James Bond? It doesn't matter. Uh, oh. Yeah, never mind. Uh, oh. It doesn't have to be that. We did that already. I'm just saying. <laughs> As we walked along the flat block marina. I was calm on the outside, but thinking all the time. So now it was to be Georgie the General, saying what we should do and what not to do, and dim as his mindless, grinning bulldog. But suddenly I vidded that thinking was for the gloopy ones, and that the omni ones used like inspiration and what bog sends. For now it was lovely music that came to my aid. There was a window open with a stereo on, and I vidied right at once what to do. So, do you, how do you how do you feel about your your Clockwork Orange experience? Are you going to go run out and recommend it to all your friends? I would go out and recommend it to all my friends, but I think they've all they've seen all it like seen fifteen it. years yeah, ago at least. So I am ready to run out and finally watch the entirety of two thousand one. Though that's what I was going to say next is that I think it's time for two thousand one. I, I think you're right. I agree. And then the we more can than... circle back and, and talk about Star Baby and personal choice. So I I don't mean to get too personal with you or anything. Uh, do you have a Star Baby tattoo? There seems to be an attachment If I had a there. tattoo, it would it would be a Star Baby. Okay. Or it would be a Vonnegut quote. I don't know. Maybe both. Oh, both. You yeah. gotta do both. You get, just wrap it around. <laughs> just wrap so it goes around the Star Baby like a... So it'll be a star baby, but with So It Goes tattooed on its forehead. You want to be that guy. Get it done. Yes. Absolutely. What's your favorite Vonnegut? Uh, I, I'm, I'm boring. Uh, Slaughterhouse is, was the first I read, and it's still the best for me. Okay. I'm probably like in terms of like obsessive weird readership, like more of a Pinchon fan. But Vonnegut was what got me into Pinchon, and then I just kind of never looked back. Okay, smart guy. Was it the film degree that gave it away? I think it was the film degree that gave it away. Yeah, maybe. So, would you say A Clockwork Orange is worth reading? Yes, it's it's a. So- it's it's not it's hard to it's it's like that it's hard to get into the specific language that's what i'm wondering is the law of it just like written phonetically uh 
Not really. I mean, he takes most of the the NADSAT from real words. Uh, it's not... So your brain kind of autofills it in? Yeah. You, you start thinking and reading that way. Um, and I know there are glossaries that you can use to translate the words. And so you have that next to you and you can look at it to figure out what they're doing. But context will eventually get you three quarters of the way. And after that, it's really just the rhythm. Um, and you'll figure it out and pick it up as you go. Just like in the movie, you, you stop like, you stop hearing yarbles and, and consciously thinking, well, those are testicles. And then eventually you just hear yarbles and think testicles, right? <laughs> From Finian's rainbow to Finnegan's wake. No, but that that's a big thing I hated about Wuthering Heights is whenever like that Scottish maid would talk and they wrote it out in her accent. I fucking hate that book, but this is a really good Kubert conversation. I appreciate it. <laughs> I was surprised at first it, it I remember it taking me a long time to get into the rhythm and you read like the first page and you have that moment where you're like fuck you book like you, you just you just can't get into it without reading it over and over again to figure out what's going on because in the book the NADSAT is much more frequent but you get there um and the movie you know, with the visual aspect is a much easier sell. The interesting thing I didn't talk about with the book and we can, I can, we can toss this out here and, and work it back through is that the extra chapter makes Alex rehabilitated. Like he actually eventually becomes a fully functioning human being in, in the world. And I read that there was some ill will eventually from Burgess about the way Kubrick ultimately treated that. And he wanted that included. I know he was angry about it being dropped from the U.S. edition. Oh, and I I'd could, imagine that's your that's your work. That's not even that. I mean, that's. You're talking about the reason someone makes a movie or writes a book. And that final mm -hmm. chapter <laughs> is the reason I believe he wrote that book. I mean, he, the reason he the ultimately he wrote that book is his wife was abused and assaulted by some um, expat World War II officers or something. Uh, I don't know the whole story. But there are some legitimate horrors in his past that inspired him to write this. And I think his wife, his wife tried to commit suicide as a result of that assault. And all that got spun into a clockwork orange. Was he a little bit of the writer in a clockwork orange? Yes. Okay. You could wow. see how that got spun directly into the writer character. And the writer character in the novel and the writer character in the movie are probably the biggest contrast besides the, the last chapter being totally lopped off. So that last chapter um, totally shifts the perspective to that, you know, people can choose and ultimately distance themselves from the trappings of their youth, the misdeeds. In Kubrick's version, he's not selling that. And um, Burgess didn't didn't like that. I just said, I mean, he's he's changing the entire purpose of his of his work. But I don't think that's a marketable story. It certainly reduces the impact of the satire that Kubrick is trying to set to, to spin in his movie. Yeah. And, and it would probably be approached differently by critics, even audiences. I'd be like, Oh, what a nice trite pat ending mm -hmm. for all this horror you've made us endure. That's it, it, rough. <laughs> it, it, yeah. It, it, it changes. I mean, what Kubrick has, has made is really a, a, a morality play. 
it's it's a fable. Um, he's reduced the the characters to ideas. I mean, they're vivid and visceral in the film, but ultimately, they're ideas. And Burgess had something entirely different in mind, and he was involved with the original treatment and screenplay and Kubrick read it and tossed it out uh, and did everything himself. And even at that point, I don't believe there was any ill will between the two of them because Kubrick had brought him on to work on the Napoleon treatment, which I thought was strange. Okay. We had such a great working relationship. I completely (laughs) didn't use what you wanted, but here's my, you know, passion project. Have a go. Stephen King isn't a fan of his version of The Shining, so... Well, Stephen King is wrong, so... (laughs) I don't know. I read the book, and I was like... (laughs) Well, thank God we stayed on top. We were, like, straight as an arrow right through that one, so I'm pretty sure I'm just going to dump this on Libsyn and call it a day. Great. Hour and 50 minutes of raw footage. We will sound brilliant. No, we are brilliant. We have to sound brilliant. <laughs> Just cut in some Wu Tang, and you're it's perfect. I I put um, I put some grave diggers in the in the Hitchcock episode, so I did have some Reza. Don't think I won't do it. I'm gonna ask for it to be removed if you don't. Okay. Well, do you have any requests? Because I'll put that in there too. Nah, no, surprise me. Okay. Well, I like that. That's good. Check out my gravel pit. From the land of the lost, behold the pale horse, or cook. Follow me, Wu Tang gotta be the best things in stocks and clock wallabies. African killer bees, black watch on your radio, blowing out your watch. From Park Hill, the house of Haunted Hill. Every time you walk, I thought you were a good match for for the Kubrick conversation, especially when it comes to a clockwork orange. I wanted to see how, at least get a taste of how your horror sensibilities lined up with what happened in clockwork orange. Yeah, I'm strange that way. I'm kind of like a baby who happens to love horror movies. Well, that, I, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I love that you sound like a pixie and you're talking about Hell Knight on Pure Cinema Pod, too. Like, it's <laughs> it's phenomenal. <laughs> Just like Kubrick, you're softening it up for the masses. Yeah, I'm here to preach you people's food for you. <laughs> Well, you know, <laughs> I hope I can somehow work that into the, right into the beginning of the podcast. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe at the end. It'll be in there somewhere, I promise. God, I regret so many things. <laughs> oh, this is fun. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> I mean, you know, want to oversell it or anything, but yeah, it was fine. Yeah, no, thank you for letting me on. This is it was different. It was very cool. It's good to know we're. It's good to know we're not alone in the world. Yeah, Cupid really brings people together. That's probably one of his finest qualities. Well, another one I haven't seen is Eyes Wide Shut, but everyone assures me it's the sexiest film ever made. The sexiest film ever made? Oh, yeah. They're like, no, really, Stephanie, watch it on a date. Trust us. Wait a minute, people said this to you? Like, No, that's why I used a comedy voice. Okay. I was, you know, people say dumb things all the time, so I can never be too sure. Yeah. Well, it's good to know your faith, where your faith in humanity is. I, I have very little. Yeah. Hopefully you don't need to scrap it. No. I'd still put something up, even if it's just the part about you saying how you're, like cinema's version of a mother feeding her baby birds. 